So let's imagine we've got a mass m attached to a spring with spring constant k. We know that the force, the force acting on the mass m, if it is displaced a distance x from uh, equilibrium, we know that the force is equal to minus kx. If that's the only force acting on the mass, and we'll assume it is for the moment, we know that the force must be equal to the mass times acceleration for the object. So we have that ma equals minus kx. This is basically the equation of motion for the mass on a spring. The mass times the acceleration is equal to minus k times the displacement. Well, does this correspond to those equations that we just derived? If we put the, accelerate, uh, the position as a function of time and the acceleration as a function of time that we derived for the uniform circular motion, do those actually describe the motion of a mass on a spring? Well, let's try it. We've got m times the acceleration. Remember, the acceleration was minus a omega squared cos omega t equals minus k times x, and remember x was a cos omega t. Is it possible for these two things to equal each other? Well, we can multiply this side out. We have minus a m omega squared cos omega t equals minus k a cos omega t. Well, we've got a cos omega t on both sides. We can divide that off. We have an a on both sides. We can divide that off. We have a minus sign on both sides. We can divide that off. And what do we have? m omega squared equals k. Or, divide by m, take the root. Omega equals k over m root. If we describe our simple harmonic motion with an angular velocity. Now, what's an angular velocity for simple harmonic motion? Hold on to that. I'll come right back to it. With omega equal to the square root of k over m, then the results that we derived for the uniform circular motion exactly describe the motion of a mass on a spring. Now, I call this an angular velocity. Well, an angular velocity makes sense when we have something going around in a circle. It tells us how many radians per second of angle is this thing rotating through. That's an angular velocity. Well, there's nothing going around in a circle when we're talking about a mass on a spring. However, if we extend our idea of what we mean by omega rather than just an angle rotation, if we think about it rather than, uh, rather than that, think about it in terms of, say, how much phase does this thing actually move through? If we think about one complete motion, or one complete oscillation. So, say, from our maximum displacement through equilibrium to the minimum displacement, back through equilibrium to our maximum displacement. Imagine that as one oscillation, say, from here to here. If we break this up into pieces, and we actually break it up into two pi pieces, kind of like breaking up uh, uh, an oscillation into 360 degrees, we'll break it up into 2 pi radians. And we think about the oscillator, <coughs> excuse me, the oscillator as oscillating through 2 pi radians of phase rather than 2 pi radians of angle. We can think of omega as something a little bit more general, and we'll think of this as an angular frequency. Not necessarily a frequency. Not necessarily an angular velocity, but something a little bit analogous to that, an angular frequency. So, for simple harmonic motion, we'll now refer to omega as the angular frequency of the motion, telling us how many radians of phase per second the oscillator is actually moving through, as opposed to an angular velocity. So, we're no longer talking about actually something going around in a circle anymore. So, if we'll remember, uh, omega is 2 pi f, 
So f is 1 over 2 pi omega. We can actually write the frequency of the motion of the simple harmonic oscillator as 1 over 2 pi root k over m. And since the period, or the frequency is 1 over the period, the period is 1 over the frequency, we can also write the period as 1 over the frequency or 2 pi root m over k. So we actually can figure out what the period of the oscillation is also. So let's stick some numbers in here. We can use uh, any values that we want to figure out whatever any unknown values are. So let's stick some numbers in. All right, so let's imagine we've got a mass attached to a spring. The other end of the spring is attached uh, rigidly to, say, a wall or something like that. Let's imagine we have a mass of 1.25 kilograms. A uh, force of, let's say, 3.20 newtons is applied to the mass, which displaces the mass a distance of 10 centimeters. It's pulled 10 centimeters with this force of 3.20 newtons and then released. So then what's going to happen? It's going to oscillate back and forth. Let's assume there is no friction between the block and the floor so that we're not losing any, uh, any energy or anything like that. We've basically got a simple harmonic oscillator like we were describing. Let's see if we can find the amplitude of the motion A the spring constant, uh, omega, f. And now I'm going to ask for a couple more things that we haven't talked about yet. Let's see if we can figure out what's the maximum speed that the object is going to have during this motion. What's the fastest that it's going to move? And then let's see if we can figure out what is the maximum acceleration that it will have. What's the maximum acceleration during uh, one oscillation? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, the amplitude. What's the amplitude of the motion? Well, we know that we displace it 10 centimeters from equilibrium and let it go. So what's the amplitude of the motion going to be? It's going to be 10 centimeters. Let's just write that in SI units. So 0 0.100 meters. So there's the amplitude. That one was easy. Uh, what about the spring constant? Um, well, we know that we displace it a distance of 10 centimeters, and that requires a force of 3.20 newtons. Well, how much is the spring going to be pulling on it? Well, it's going to be pulling back the other direction with the same force, 3.20 newtons. We know that the applied, the, the force from the spring is minus kx, so k is going to be minus f over x, minus f over x. So we'll have a minus, the force from the spring will be in the negative direction, so that's going to be minus 3.20 newtons for a displacement of 0 0.100 meters. So K is going to be, these cancel, 3.2 divided by 0.1 or 32, 32.0 newtons per meter. So there's the spring constant. What about, okay, so we've got A, we've got K, what about omega? Well, let's remember, omega is root K over M. So that's going to be 32 newtons per meter divided by, what's M? Well, that's 1.25 kilograms. Root, so we have omega is equal to 5.06. And I'll write the units as radians per second. If you divide out these units, you just get inverse seconds, but we'll stick the radians in there to emphasize that this is an angular frequency. So omega is 5.06 radians per second. What is f? f, we know, is omega over 2 pi. So we just have to take this value, divide by 2 pi, and we get... 0 0.805 inverse seconds. An inverse second we can actually write as the units of hertz. 1 over seconds is 1 hertz. 1 inverse second is 1 hertz, which we'll write as 1 capital H lowercase z. So 1 hertz just means, or a hertz is a cycle per second. 
tells us the number of cycles per second. Um, okay, there we go. Now, V max, let's think about the velocity. Let's go back to our result for the velocity. I'm going to erase all of this now. So here we have the velocity, V equals minus A omega sine omega t. What's the maximum value that this thing can have? We know that sine oscillates between positive 1 and negative 1. So the maximum value that this thing can have will be when sine omega t is negative 1, to cancel out the negative here, which gives rise to V is equal to A omega. That's the maximum value that the velocity can have. We'll call that V max. So where is the object actually going at this velocity? If we think about it moving back and forth, it's stopping at the extreme point. So it's stopping when the position is A, and it's stopping when the position is minus A. It's actually moving the fastest as it moves through the central position. In other words, the equilibrium position. So it's moving at the fastest as it moves to the right. That'll be when v max, uh, when v is equal to a omega, the highest value, and then it'll be moving at minus a omega when it's moving back to the left at its fastest value. So it passes the equilibrium moving to the right at a omega, and then passes equilibrium as it's moving to the left at minus a omega. And that's when it'll be moving its fastest. Then what about a max? What about the greatest um, acceleration that it has. Well, we know that a is equal to minus a, little a, acceleration is minus big A, omega squared, cos omega t. Again, cosine oscillates from plus 1 to minus 1. So this is going to have its maximum value when cos omega t is again negative 1 to cancel this, and a max will be a omega squared. So when does the object have its maximum acceleration? Well, that's going to be when cos is negative 1. In other words, when it's at its most uh, negative position. So when it's at uh, x equals minus a, that's when the acceleration will be a omega squared. Now, why is that? Where does that come from? Well, if we go back to f equals minus kx, when is the force acting on the object going to be maximum? Well, the force will be maximum when x is at its largest negative value. That's where the force will be the greatest. That's when it's at its most negative position. Well, when the force is the greatest, that's when the acceleration is going to be the greatest because f equals ma. Largest force means biggest acceleration. So the acceleration has its maximum value when the object is, as, is at its most negative position. That's when the spring is compressed the most and is pushing back to the right, giving it the, the greatest positive acceleration. Where will this be the greatest negative value? Well, that will be when it's at its most farthest uh, position to the right. That's when x is largest, largest positive. The, the force will be largest negative. The acceleration will have its greatest value uh, to the left. So we have v max is a omega. A max is A omega squared. So we can stick our numbers in there. What do we have? We have V max equals A, if we'll remember, A is 0 0.100 meters, and omega, if we'll remember, is 5.06 radians per second, and so V max is equal to 0.1 times uh, 5.06, 0 0.506 meters per, uh, meters per second. That will be the uh, fastest velocity the object will have. And then A max will be A 0 0.100 uh, meters times omega 5.06 radians per, per second squared. Multiply that out and we find A max is equal to 2.56 meters per second squared. There we go. So there is our uh, value. There are our values for V max and A max. Now, if we think about this in terms of energy, if we displace our mass to the right, 
we have to do work on the object. We are pulling the mass to the right, we are applying a force to the right, our force is to the right, so we do work on the object. Where is that work going? Well, it's being stored as energy in the spring, in an elastic potential energy. This is a new type of potential energy. We have already talked about gravitational potential energy, that if I push on this object and raise it upwards, I do work on the object that work is then stored as potential energy in the object, which can be released if I uh, allow it to drop down. That potential energy then turns into kinetic energy. Well, in the same way that if I do work on this mass and I stretch the spring and I release it, well, that comes back as kinetic energy. So I've stored that energy in the spring as potential energy. So that is a new kind of potential energy, a new kind of stored energy that we will call elastic potential energy. So how much energy is actually stored in the spring? So let's go back to our mass on the spring. We've got some mass m, spring constant k. Let's figure out how much work we have to do to take this mass from its equilibrium position and pull it over to some displacement x. Well, to figure out the amount of work done, we know that work is equal to force times displacement times the cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the force and the displacement. In this case, my force that I am applying is to the right, the displacement is to the right, and so the angle between them is zero. So theta is zero, cosine of zero is one, so we'll just get rid of that. So what we have to figure out is what is the force times the displacement. Now the problem is that when we have a spring, as I pull on this spring, at equilibrium the force is zero. But as I increase x, the force itself is increasing. So the force is not a constant. So we cannot just use F times the displacement because the force is not constant. Well, what's happening to the force? Well, at equilibrium, the force is equal to zero. The force that we have to apply is equal to zero. At our complete displacement x, the force that we apply is kx. Now, I'm not putting a minus sign in here because we're actually talking about the work that we are doing as opposed to the work that the spring is doing. So, over our displacement from zero to the complete displacement x, our force varies from zero to kx. Well, let's take the average value. You might say, well, why will that work? Well, let's just try it, and then we'll actually see that it will work. The average value of the force going from 0 to kx will be 1 half kx. So if we use the average value of our force, and then times our displacement, which is x, we get 1 half kx squared. That's a reasonable argument, but we'll actually see that that does work. So the potential energy that is stored in our spring that has extended a distance x is equal to 1 half kx squared. And there is a new type of potential energy that we'd have to add into the additional potential energy of the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy uh, in terms of our total mechanical energy. So this is another potential energy that we have to put in there. So let's go back to our original problem. We've got some mass m attached to our spring k. Let's imagine, it is dis let's imagine it's undergoing simple harmonic motion. At some time, it's at some position x, and it is moving with some velocity v. Let's look at what the total amount of energy is that the, the mass has. We know the uh, total energy will be equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. The potential energy that we just derived is one-half kx squared. But we know what the values for the position as a function of time and the velocity as a function of time. We know what those are. So let's stick those in here and let's figure out what the energy of our object is as a function of time. So what do we get? We get 1 half m, the velocity we know is minus a omega sine omega t, 
So we have to square that. Plus 1 half k x, which is a cos omega t squared. So there's our total energy. Now let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. We've got a minus squared that just drops out. <clears throat> so we have 1 half m a squared omega squared sine squared omega t plus 1 half k a squared cos squared omega t. All right, there we go. This is a, looks a little messy. But let's remember omega was the square root of k over m or omega squared is just k over m. So we've got m times k over m. That, the m's cancel, leaving us with k. So this is 1 half ka squared. That's the m and the omega squared. That becomes k. Sine squared plus 1 half ka squared cos squared. Omega t. Well, look at this. We've got 1 half ka squared times sine squared and 1 half ka squared times cos squared. We can factor out a 1 half ka squared, which leaves us with sine squared plus cos squared, which we know is 1. And so this is nothing more than 1 half ka squared. The total energy is 1 half ka squared. Well, look at that. Those are all constants. There is no time dependence in there. What does this tell us? The total energy of the oscillator is constant. It does not change over time. The sum of Ke and Pe has a constant value. Well, that should tell us that the result that we got for the potential energy, 1 half Kx squared, that's the correct form because it gives rise to a total energy that is conserved. Um, a, uh, a sum of the kinetic and potential that does not change with time. Now, what, where does this value come from? Well, if we think about it, if we were to allow our oscillator to move all the way to its final uh, maximum amplitude, a position of A, what happens at that point? That's where it moves, stops, and turns around and comes back. Well, what's the kinetic energy at that point? Kinetic energy is zero. That's where it stops. Well, what's the, uh, all the mechanical energy then would be potential. Well, how much potential energy does it have at that point? One half kx squared, but x is equal to a, one half ka squared. Well, there we go. That makes sense. So the uh, total amount of energy that the oscillator has is equal to the potential energy that it has at its maximum displacement, and that corresponds to one half ka squared. We can actually stick the values in from our previous problem. We can figure out what's the total mechanical energy of our system. And what do we get? The total amount of energy in our system is 1 half Ka squared, which from our last problem will be 1 half times K, which was 32 newtons per meter times A, which was 0 0.100 meters, squared, multiply that out, and we get 0 0.160 joules. And that is the total kinetic energy, uh, the total mechanical energy that we have. One more thing we can actually do, we can actually figure this out here. We know that this total energy is completely potential when the object is at a maximum uh, position. So the total energy is 1 half Ka squared. But what about when the object passes through its equilibrium position? What's the potential energy in that case? Well, x is 0, so 1 half Kx squared is 0. It has no potential energy when the oscillator passes through equilibrium. So where's the energy then? It's all kinetic. So let's figure out what the velocity is when the object passes through its equilibrium position. So this must equal 1 half mv squared. Well, we can figure out what the velocity is at that point. We know that v must be equal to 2 times 0 0.160 joules divided by the mass. If we'll remember our previous problem, and the mass was 1.25 kilograms, take the square root, 
Divide that out, and what do we get? That is 0 0.506 meters per second. So that would be the speed as it passes through equilibrium. But, if you'll remember, that is exactly what we calculated for Vmax. So, that also demonstrates that we can solve for the maximum velocity by solving for the total energy of the system and setting that equal to the kinetic energy as it passes through equilibrium. Well, there we go. That's all for our simple harmonic oscillators for now. We will take a look at another system that initially might look like simple harmonic motion, but we'll see actually is not perfectly simple harmonic like the motion of a mass on an ideal spring. And we'll see that next time.